Welcome back to another fun segment of The Time When, where I visit religious institutions that don't agree with me to learn stuff to be smarter about said religious institution. In today's fun adventure, I'm going to take you on a journey with me to a Sean Bowles prophetic night event. If you don't know what this event is, this was when Sean Bowles was on his prophetic tour in 2019 and he came through my city. The ad for the event said that it's a powerful evening seminar on hearing God's voice and incorporating the prophetic into your sphere of influence and daily life. Prophecy in this definition seems to mean how we can hear God's voice and relay it to others. Now, before I even get started, three things. Number one, because I get accused of this almost every video I make on this topic, I am not a cessationist. I do not think the sign gifts ceased in the first century, in other words. I believe that there actually might be authentic prophetic words for the church that is recognizable by looking at the prophets in scripture. I am not in complete disagreement with everything in the charismatic community. I would even consider myself, you guys, a left of center charismatic, but I would consider many parts of the prophetic faith cure movement to be in serious error. Also, I want to emphasize and make perfectly clear that I am not here to bash on Sean Bowles. The internet has become such a place of tribalism and everyone is a hammer looking for a nail. And I hope to portray my experience in good faith and taste. Disagreement does not equal attack. I do have a bone to pick with many teachings within the hyper charismatic movement due to bad theology. And because bad theology hurts people, I believe with all my heart that it's necessary to speak up about it. So in other words, I can disagree with Sean Bowles and not be a guns blazing heresy hunter about it. I want to focus on why I disagree without tearing him down. And ironically, because of this, I know people in the comment section either hate or love this. I realize there's no way to get around it. I don't like to be pressured into being a bully or apathetic. So all I can do is look at scripture, not at what people expect of me. A scripture that lives rent free in my brain when it comes to this, a second Timothy 2, 23 through 26. So I'm going to give a very firm but fair assessment of my experience. Number two, uh, this visit is a little different than my other The Time When videos. This was in 2019 and I actually vlogged it. So I have video of this visit. In hindsight, I wish I'd recorded much more, but uh, this was before I had a presence on YouTube or even really started using my channel. So because of that, I will share mostly audio and maybe some video from this event that I took. I went into this whole event with an open mind. I don't want to go into this with some sort of vendetta. So in sharing my thoughts, I hope people find it fair. Number three, Yes, I purposely seek to go to churches, events, and places to learn more about them. If I'm honest with you guys, I love this stuff. I want to observe, learn, ask questions, and take the opportunity to share a different perspective if given the chance. Uh, I said this in my Jehovah's Witness video, but I really crave proper and correct information, and I'm genuinely curious to understand other perspectives so I can be a better witness of Christ. I want to accurately articulate the opposing views of people with whom I disagree with. I would want the same done to me. In my opinion, I think this is wise. The best apologists I've ever known are equipped strongly with scripture, a love for the lost, and are sharp as attack when it comes to uh, what I would say translating other beliefs because they understand them. It's like learning another language to communicate better. I think that that is a great example for us all. Okay, now that preliminary thoughts are out of the way, let's just jump right in. I'm going to share this in three parts. First, I'm going to share the sermon, the talk that he gave. Uh, second part, I'm going to share some audio clips and my thoughts on some prophecies given after the sermon. Then in the third part, I'm going to give my closing thoughts. So I drive to the church and when I get to the church, I was immediately greeted as to be expected. And I right away asked permission if I could film part of the event so I didn't look all sus with my phone out. <laughs> When I walked into the sanctuary, worship was going on and the charismatic environment did not disappoint. This was my very first time being in person at an event like this or in a charismatic Pentecostal like environment in general. There was a lot of dancing, especially this one woman in the back behind me. She, she was just getting down. She was having a great time. <laughs> 
uh, and of course they have the flags that they wave. Um, and I, honestly, I regret that I didn't get any video of this just to simply remember the experience. Then introductions were made and Sean Bowles himself came out and did a talk about the prophetic. Now, I'm an avid note taker, but I wouldn't say I'm an organized one sometimes, but when I wanna take notes, I use what's available to me. And in this case, I used the offering envelope from Bowles Ministries. No shade to Bowles, but I thought this was a better use for it anyways. So, and I know what some of you are thinking, could have just used your phone? No, it's not the same. What I did is I actually compiled all of these notes so that you can get an idea of the general lessons and point of the talk. I'm gonna read them to you, then I'm gonna give my thoughts about it afterward. So remember that this is a prophetic seminar, trying to help Christians live in the prophetic. That was the topic uh, and point of the talk. About 20 minutes in so far, just normal charismatic uh, motivational message that I have both agreements and disagreements with. Spoke too soon. He quotes John 10.10, 10, which says, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy, which I've heard this quoted many times in charismatic circles. He's basically saying that your life will be better than everyone else's. God will bless you more than anyone else. He then gave a list of super blessed Jews, because of the persecution they endured. Next point, seems like bad theology and mismanaged hermeneutics and outright heresy at this point. This is how God thinks according to what Bowles is saying. He used Solomon as an example of how he asked for divine intelligence. He asked for the mind of God. Solomon asked for the mind of God, then quotes the Hebrew word for wisdom to support this. And I put a star next to this. The reason why is that I think I was really trying to understand how uh, Sean Bowles and people in his environment and his sphere of influence see this. And I think that I had an aha moment when he was talking about this in the sense that I understood his position. Next note, uh, now he's talking about praying to get wisdom from God and the power of prayer. Totally agree with him here. I actually remember that. I thought it was really good. Next note, he's saying that for many people, receiving a prophetic word from someone is equivalent to receiving an answer to prayer. It's interesting how there seems to be a divide between apologetics and prophecy. When challenged, he couldn't defend his faith, but was given a word and that made him a believer. Then I wrote, how and why is this different from anybody else in any other religion who has had a similar experience. When it comes down to it, shouldn't there be some sort of tangible defense for why we believe what we do besides experience? The talk goes on and I wrote, uh, he's talking about Bob Jones, who I just consider to be a huge theological red flag. Some of the strangest beliefs that I've ever heard come from Bob Jones. And I'm really stunned that a lot of people in the charismatic community actually look up to him as a spiritual role model. I don't think that's safe. Next, he says that uh, you do not need people to guide you as we have the Holy Spirit, which that is in the Bible. However, a lot of people think that they're hearing from God, you know, hearing from the Holy Spirit when it's not the Holy Spirit. It's not God at all. There's, uh, I noticed that he had no scripture or mention of scripture being foundational here. So how do you test what you're hearing? First John 4, right? You gotta, you gotta test these things. Next, he's talking about getting into the word, which I totally agree with. He is saying good stuff here. Uh, next, I'm noticing some inconsistencies. It can be confusing talking about scripture then experience. He used Revelation 1 as a proof text that we can now see God face to face. He explains it as if it's making us like God, bringing on our fullness at the end of the age. To me, it seems like lots of life application stuff, not a lot of solid theology, which is something I noticed. Remember, this is in 2019, so my research has come a long way since taking these notes and coming to this event, and this is something I've, I've noticed a lot in these circles. He's saying that if we see people how God sees them, then prophecy will come according to him. Next, he's saying the gifts are not dead, which I agreed with him here. Next, if you want the prophetic, he is saying to see God's love in everything. So if you want prophecy, if you want... Uh, prophecy from God, see God's love in everything. He's saying, and stop complaining and seeing the negative. We need to see the best in everyone because everyone is awesome. He also speaks about being shown things in our heart, not our head, that he loves to speak, that God loves, that Jesus loves to speak in parables and in signs. And I actually have an audio clip about this. But the way he speaks a lot of times requires interpretation because he loves to speak things in parables, symbols, signs, in ways that will cause your heart to understand something 
Now's just your hat. We're at the end of the talk. Um, two more notes. I said, I think this is like the eighth time the upper room has been mentioned. <laughs> The last note I have, at the end, he gave words of knowledge and talked about interpreting dreams. He then prayed for visions, dreams, and revelations for the audience. So, those were my compiled notes of the sermon. I actually didn't read them right off of here. I actually typed them up in order and printed them out. So Now, as you can see, I agreed with some of what he said. I was a little indifferent with some and disagreed with some. The last part where he's talking about seeing the best in everyone because everyone is awesome, I, I can see what he was trying to say. I do, but, but this is problematic when it comes to the heart and the mind. Uh, Norman Geisler is quoted saying that uh, God never bypasses the mind on the way to the heart. Now I'm gonna get into much more detail about my thoughts on this after the second part of this video, but I really wanted to point that out. Uh, that I just did not agree with that. So uh, speaking of the second part of this video, uh, this is where he started giving prophecies. He then went straight prophetic, going around the room, giving prophecies. And guys, I'm just gonna be real with you here. This is where I just completely fall into disagreement with Bowles. And I'm gonna be very honest about why I disagree with him while not degrading him. I did get video of a lot of this I'll share only audio here. I want to protect the privacy of the people there, so I will not be showing any faces, and I will edit out uh, names and any personal information that I feel is necessary for their privacy and to protect them. Some of it is hard to hear, so um, it's a lot of work, but I did my best to add captions so everyone could understand. Uh, before I share the clips though, I want everyone to know that I'm also going to be leaving an article in the description of this video written by Greg Kokel, whom I highly respect about this topic. Uh, the name of the article is Does God Whisper? And he's talked about this before, and I think it's a really good explanation about prophecy. So be sure to check it out. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and share some of these clips with you uh, from this talk from the seminar. Uh, in this first clip, he's saying that he's getting a word about Washington. I will give my thoughts after you hear it. Um, I'm still thinking about the Washington word, and I keep saying Everett Washington. Is there anybody who's from Everett Washington? Does that make sense to anybody? Over here, it says just man's there. Are you from Everett or you live there? Uh, we're from Washington. Okay, so do you live here now? Yes. And are you in business? No, I I work for the city and my wife is my school. Um, I don't, I, I'm, I'm fishing because I'm like, I'm just praying into what I'm seeing. I'll tell you that the picture I saw, I don't have an exact interpretation, but I saw this picture of um, uh, a storm, like an, almost like a five year storm that I saw, I saw a time frame of like a calendar, but I saw um, it's now in the distance, and I just thought that God was showing me that you guys have made some great choices together, and that it's put family storms and issues from generational stuff behind you. And I feel like you've set yourselves up, and I hope this makes sense, in ways in your family that family patterns won't be repeated, those are the bad ones, but family patterns are the good ones, are going to be great, they'll be repeated. And I felt like it's going to be an example to family who still lives in the storm. They're going to look outside and go, what does health look like? And they're going to see you guys. What does normal look like? And they're going to see you guys. And I feel like there's something so special about the choices you've made to be model choices. You know, I just felt like, uh, I don't know if you ever want to run for an office, but I just feel like there's an office coming, and I feel like the Lord's saying, like, uh, I feel like the Lord's saying, I've been grooming you for something bigger than what you're even thinking about right now. And there's steps to get there, but I feel like there's part of you that has always known this or has felt this for a long time, but then there's part of you that is so... All right, now I'm just going to be honest with you guys here. Uh, this straight up reminded me of a cold reading I would see from a psychic. Scripturally speaking, um, I think that if we're going to hear from God about something, I, I don't know. I don't understand why it needs to be so vague. I, I call this prophecy darts, um, where things are just said at random until one gets close to the target, right? And you just kind of focus in on that, ignoring the rest that were totally off target. Like nobody pays attention to all the stuff that was wrong. Um, then he talks about a vision that he got. And in my opinion, that's even more confusing. This is what I call fortune cookie theology, where what's given is vague and it can kind of be applied very subjectively to your situation. Telling someone that a storm is coming 
or that they will be making a big decision this year is not new information for literally everyone in the world. <laughs> that they are going to be an example for other people going through the same thing and they're gonna be making model choices. With that being said, I could prophesy that over everybody watching, right? I, could, I prophesy that you're gonna be going through something this year. And you know what? God's gonna bring you through it. And don't you worry about that problem that you're having. You know what? God, I'm gonna speak over you right now. God is gonna bring you through it. And you know what? Other people, I prophesy that other people are gonna be seeing this and they're gonna be so inspired by the storm that you're going through right now that they are going to, to get through it too because of you. So don't you give up. Don't, don't Stay with it, stay strong. It's not a prophecy. Prophet Melissa says that is not a prophecy. That does not count. <laughs> then with saying that God is grooming them for something bigger in the political sphere, again, prophecy darts, fortune cookie theology, very vague. To me, what I observe is that this seems like it's safe enough to put forward in case he's wrong, but accurate enough to say in case he's right. These are not parable prophecies, in my opinion, right? He's talking about, you know, parables that Jesus likes to speak uh, through parables and that a lot of prophecies are going to be relayed through signs, visions, things like that. I think that saying that prophecies are like parables gives us an easy way out in case you're wrong. God giving a prophecy is very different than Jesus telling a parable. When people got prophecy, it was incredibly specific and it was not always good news. The other thing I noticed um, in these audio clips, um, all of them virtually, I lost track about how many times he said, I feel like God is telling me this. So uh, that's something to kind of look out for and watch for whenever you listen to these clips. Now, this second clip, I edited out some names. He starts calling out specific numbers, uh, which happened to be their address, which I immediately edited out, of course, of this clip. But this clip starts right as he has revealed this information to her and us, the group of people, and uh, they said that they just moved here. Here's the clip. Here's what I think is that the Lord is saying that um, I've made your house a resting place for my spirit. And I feel like the Lord's given you a special ability to bring beauty and creativity. Are you in a, some sort of creative profession or something? <laughs> holy, holy. <laughs> I'm surprised. Why are we surprised right now? I am surprised too. Like. So what is a creative profession? What are you in? Uh, I'm a creative pastor. At Woo! Church. Wow. That's um, awesome. And then also on my own business. You own your own business. What kind of business is it? Um, okay, media all around. Yeah. So I, I just feel like uh, there's something about because uh, I kept seeing creative projects that would highlight justice issues and kingdom issues, and also I saw humor. So I kept seeing those two. And I felt like the Lord was saying that I'm giving your family the ability to have a platform to speak a message, not just to be a family. By the time you pass away when you're very old, because I think you're both going to have a long life, and God's even cutting off the curse of cancer off your family, Abby. Okay, again, I would be a lot more impressed if he didn't ask questions feeling around for an answer. This isn't me being critical. This is me assessing a situation where someone is basically claiming to get divine revelation from God. In scripture, God is completely specific. So, so specific that he names names, times, and what exactly is going to happen. What, I, what I'm observing is that Sean Bowles is giving encouragement to them, which is not wrong. This is great because what they're doing is wonderful, but asking leading questions about jobs, that could have a yes or no answer, I just think that's really strange. A creative professional is vague and people will automatically volunteer information after they start talking. And I swear, I'm not trying to be cynical or critical here, but these are just general questions that I have about these types of things. He's prophesying long life, cures from cancer and success. This is the formula for prophecy in many of these circles where you're sort of not allowed to give bad news. I remember uh, if you've seen my video about the time when a Christian visited a psychic, <laughs> uh, to be fair, I was still really into new age stuff, but uh, there was almost this impression of, okay, when you sit down with a psychic and you're not open to getting a reading, they know it. They're like, you're really closed off from me reading you right now. Uh, but if somebody goes in and they're really, really eager, like my best friend was, they're gonna be read really easily. And I, I noticed this dynamic. People do not go to these things typically 
to not hear from God. They're going expecting to hear from God. So they're not going to be questioning what they perceive as a word from God. So it's almost like they give more information than they really need to. And if it were me and I were Sean Bowles, that would make it really easy to tell them certain things that would make it seem like it's from God. All right, let's uh, go to the third clip. Let me show it to you and then I'll give you my thoughts. I saw like you and your husband had seen how you were and I saw you and your husband. And I was going, I wrote down a number two. I'm going to just make sure I get this because I'll forget it because my brain is in this vision. Um, so I was going to your anniversary of your marriage. You were having all kinds of people over. And you were embracing and revealing part of yourself that hasn't been present to the world around you. And it's like there's something about um, expressions of who you haven't been able to be yet because of all the other stuff in life that has happened, just careers and family. And I saw in this next anniversary time, and I have no idea what your anniversary is, but I saw part of you was rising up that just hasn't been able to be front and center because it's just life. We're known for our first names and our last names, but what's in that middle space? What does God want known that we're not known for? And he's going to show you some things that I believe is going to change the course of your life. Like 2020 is going to be a pivotal, life-changing year that will change the course of your life. All right, in this third clip, he calls out specific names, as you can see. In uh, this case, he calls out the middle name of a woman and the middle name of her husband. He just calls out the name and asks if it means anything to anyone. He then proceeds to tell them that he got a vision about them, and it makes sense to him why the middle names were used because there's that part of themselves that they're holding back. And honestly, guys, again, this just sounds like fortune cookie theology to me. It's life application. Uh, this could apply to probably, again, everyone in the room, but not only that, but again, names, dates, birthdays, anniversaries, or something that I'm just, they're just something I'm really suspicious of. I can't sit here and accuse bulls of looking at people on Facebook or the internet before he got there because I have absolutely zilch proof of that but I think I'm within my right to wonder and ask a few questions. He then mentions a Psalm chapter to them and asked if it meant anything. And she said that it was their address. So I edited that part out again too, but he said that he kept seeing the Psalm with this number and she associated that with their address. And he also knew their anniversary, which again, I had to clip out a lot of it because it was personal information, but what he ends with, I thought was really interesting. Now, remember this is in 2019. Nobody could have seen what happened in 2020, right before a certain virus came and ruined everything. He tells these people that the year 2020 is going to be their year and it will bring life change. I could have said that to literally anybody, anybody in 2019, and it would have been true on some level, positive or negative. It's the fortune cookie type response. And I hope I'm clearly relaying here why this is a huge problem. If this is God speaking through bowls, then this is not new information for these people to use in their life somehow. All right, now I saved the worst one for last. <laughs> Let me just go ahead and show it to you and then I will give my thoughts. Um, I'm excited for you. I feel like um, the Lord showed me when I saw this, and this is, I'm still seeing it because it's active, but I saw you holding like a net and I saw you making like, you're sewing almost like the, the women who sewed the original American flag. Like I saw you sewing a net together and you're networking people for the sake of connecting hearts so there could be a greater net in the region. But you live here. And I felt like the Lord was saying, you have the ability to create unity and beauty. And I feel like it's for both of you. I just felt like the Lord was showing me your hands making the net. So I don't know why you showed me. Maybe, maybe you can call out more. I don't know. Maybe you get more attention for this or whatever. But I felt like it's just as important for both of you. Yeah, I feel like it's a now thing, not 10 years from now or when you're 40. Did you guys do anything like this or is there is this an indicator of anything? Well, there's there's a couple things. First of all, I mean, I, I, I started a ministry a few years ago that was all based about just unity. Like, when we have unity wow. in the church and we have unity in the faith, regardless of our different denominations and all that. Yeah, and I've just been doing, like, creative things and sewing, like, clothes. And oh, that's amazing. Yeah, so there's something about your creativity and then unity and mandate that, that it's going to be a theme in your life, both of the creativity and the unity. And they're going to go hand in hand. There's creative projects to do together with other churches that are going to help bring that sense of unity for when the cars do business. <laughs> Just as you're uh, detailing cars, that there's something about um, that you help bring 
to the atmosphere of your life, uh, to the kingdom of God, you bring the cleanness, the detail of God that way too. There's something about you being present causes things to just be cleaner and, and more full. And I, I, whether or not this is the most successful thing you'll ever do, it doesn't matter. God's identifying it as a prophetic parable for things you'll be doing in the future. But you're going to take churches and ministries that are having a time where they need to be restored and fullness and new again. You're going to help do that. You're going to be a coach and an advisor and a board member at different times in your life of ministries and churches. And I feel like the Lord is saying, you're ecumenical. You're not just like a one church guy, although you'll have deep roots in one church, but you'll, you'll be part of many things. And I feel like the Lord is saying, it's, it's part of you learning how to be a father. And you're learning at a young age, which is really special. All right, here I had to clip out the first part because he's saying that it's just an impression that he's getting uh, and a date and a name. And a guy stood up and said, hey, that's my name and that's my birthday. So obviously I don't want to share that information here, but I want to get the context to you at the beginning of this clip of what that was. It's this guy and his wife, and Bowles is saying that creativity and unity will be a theme in their life. Here is the clearest example of what I would consider a huge red flag and would throw a wrench in his supposed prophecy. And again, I have no idea what he does, all right? But the husband says that he started a ministry about unity, no matter our denomination. Bowles is saying that this is blessed by God. If people believe that Bowles is hearing from God, then there's no need to seek scriptural support for this. I mean, I have questions like, what kind of unity is he talking about? Is this guy promoting ecumenism? Is he a progressive in the pew? Is he supporting unbiblical unity? I, I call this pickle juice theology. I have a lot of names for things to describe them, I'm realizing, but this is where people mix what ought not to be mixed together for the sake of false unity. Nobody asks for clarification, but instead is supposedly given a word from God about his favor, about God's favor on this. And then as Sean Bowles is speaking, he kind of stops short and says something that uh, something else came to him. And then he mentions the word car. And people act like they know exactly what he means, right? You can hear the audience. He asks the guy what he does for a living, and he says that he works detailing cars. He then gives an entire prophecy. Bowles gives an entire prophecy of what that means. He uses that information and says that to the kingdom of God, he's bringing detail and cleanliness. He says that this is a prophetic parable for what's going to be happening in his future without any knowledge of what this guy's belief is, how good his theology is, or even if he's qualified. Bowles straight up tells him that God is going to use him to clean up churches, to help restore them, and give them more detail for unity purposes. Then Bowles says that he feels like God is telling him that this guy is ecumenical. And I don't know if you guys can hear it in the audio, but my mouth literally dropped open when he said that. I can kind of hear it when I listen to it. Now, just in case, maybe you're having trouble understanding why I even see that this is an issue. Let me let me try to explain this a, a little bit more in depth. If you're not aware of the issue with ecumenism, some people find this to be very problematic. It's more than just Christian unity. In some cases, it can become a progressive bent. The most basic way that I can put it is there's a strong potential for religious pluralism where unity is the focus, pickle juice theology. The danger with this is compromising good theology for the sake of unity. And I hope I'm not being misunderstood as being against unity. I'm very vocal about petty divisions in the church, uh, but this is very different. What does he mean by this? Is he talking about unity in a biblical sense? Is he talking about a progressive type of unity? Um, I'm sure if he had the chance to answer that directly, he would say, you know, of course not, but he just gave this guy a prophecy. Sean Bowles gave this guy a prophecy uh, saying that what he's doing is right and good in God's eyes. Nobody sought to get clarity or more information about this. And for all we know, Sean Bowles told a random person who might have questionable theology that could end up hurting somebody and shipwrecking faith, that God spoke to him and God gave his blessing and now has a prophecy. He has a prophecy card that he can play about this unity he's supposed to bring forth. And I've got to be honest, I think this is reckless. Again, to quote Norman Geisler, he says, bad methodology leads to bad theology. If there is no doctrinal compromise on core Christian beliefs, if the gospel is not being watered down or sidelined, if believers can maintain a clear testimony before the world, and if God is glorified, then I say we may freely join 
and joyfully join hands with other believers. I'm just so surprised that there was not better judgment in this area. Uh, now, I know I said that I had video of this event that I wanted to share, but I gotta be honest, uh, most of it was inside the church and I don't want to disrespect anybody's privacy. So the uh, last clip that I'm gonna show you is a video of me leaving. It's a short clip, about 30 seconds or so, and I just wanted to show it to you so that you could see my uh, fresh general assessment of my experience. Overall, my first impression was that it was not, it kind of was what I thought and not at the same time. Parts of it were what I would expect and other parts weren't what I thought it would be. Sean Bowles is a good guy. Sean Bowles is nice. He's well-spoken, funny, charismatic. <laughs> I'm sorry. I don't know why I'm like this. <laughs> All right, now that we've gone through the first part, which is the sermon, the second part, which is the audio clips, I'm gonna move on to the third part, which are my final impressions of all of this. First thought, Sean Bowles is very well-spoken, funny, and likable. I did not totally disagree with him. I thought he had interesting things to say, uh, particularly when he was doing his talk, even if I didn't completely agree. I understood his position better even if I disagreed with it. He had great stage presence and people leaned in closer when he spoke. It was very clear how people respected this man. But I think that's the point though. Um, this man hears from God, right? He's anointed. We want what he has and want to be seen how he is seen. I, I remember liking Sean Bowles. I thought he had some good things to say. There's some truth in what he said. But I think I've been clear on my disagreements. Throughout the talk and night, there was an obvious imbalance and overemphasis of the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. Number two, second thought. Uh, there was one thought that I wanted to share about all of this that a friend actually brought up and I hadn't thought about. When I told her I was going to this event uh, and then later on I was gonna actually make a video uh, about the event and my experience, said she was surprised that nobody knew I was there as a curious bystander. Everyone that he called on were members of the church or associated with the church somehow. She thought it was a missed opportunity on his part to show me how wrong I was. <laughs> I, I totally admit that I might be reaching here, uh, but I thought that that was a really interesting point. I'm not closed off to this stuff, but I have rarely seen it in an environment where it's not abused somehow. So having an authentic prophecy that's biblically based instead of more like a psychic reading, I think would be a good start for those that are thoughtful about these things. In other words, she was having trouble understanding why I specifically didn't get a prophecy, you know, considering that I was probably the odd one out in that whole building. Number three, there was a lot of shared stories. One thing that I've noticed over the years after researching this movement is that in these circles, there's a ton of storytelling. And I can't help but notice there's always an emphasis on stories. And these are fantastical stories uh, about going up to see God face to face, going to different glory realms of God, seeing blue angels, feathers, gold dust, voices, or uh, making people fall down when you walk by them because the Holy Spirit is so strong on you. I mean, there's a lot of this stuff, right? That's probably a modest explanation, a more modest explanation of some of the stories I've heard. But in this case, there was a lot of stories about knowing information that was supposedly only from God for other people. It's odd to me that God would only know jobs, addresses, names, and anniversaries. Uh, I usually have a rule about these sorts of things because this is scriptural. First John, we're supposed to test everything. We're supposed to, First Thessalonians, Deuteronomy 18, we're supposed to test these things. I think there needs to be a healthy discernment about these sorts of things. Our worldview as Christians is supernatural, okay? I don't have a problem with that, but I also don't think that we need to lust after the supernatural so much to the point that we idolize and exaggerate it. So I just think it's smart to be wise in our assessment but not overly critical to where we shut these things out completely. We shouldn't be so quick to believe someone's story because one interesting thing that I've noticed is that many people hear these stories, but then get incredibly frustrated when they don't experience the same thing. There's a strange sort of spiritual hierarchy with this arrangement 
where people don't feel as loved by God if they aren't having constant experiences. Which brings me to my fourth point. I have a video about this that goes into more detail. Uh, and if I'm honest, it's one of my favorite videos I've ever done because I feel like it touches on the core of the problem that I have within many hyper charismatic circles. I'll leave it in the description for you to check out, but basically I believe the issue is lust and idolatry for the supernatural. We have a supernatural worldview as Christians, like I mentioned before. So I'm not talking about how God moves and works in our lives. I'm talking about an extreme view. And the example that I like to use to help explain this is when we find ourselves at the beginning of a brand new relationship, right? A lot of people typically have very strong, passionate feelings at first. I call this the Twitter pated stage, which some people get and some people don't, but it's a reference to Bambi. <laughs> Basically, it's mindless, emotionally charged feelings, and it's addicting. And the problem is that this feeling is temporary. It's not sustainable. What I've observed that can happen sometimes is there's this almost uh, toxic cycle to keep this feeling alive, which becomes the priority. Basically, if you're not Twitter pated all the time, then they don't love you. Now, take that example and apply it to a relationship with God. And I have a sort of theory about this, that uh, this is kind of how it works with those who are addicted to or idolize the supernatural. I say that they are addicted to this sensation. If you're not constantly filled with the Holy Spirit, if you're not Twitter pated all the time, then you're not as loved by God. This is an extreme belief, and I believe this creates a lot of damage. There are actually Christians out there that don't believe they're loved by God unless they're having these experiences all the time, unless they're hearing from God all the time. I'm talking about churches that, that teach that you need to be Twitter-pated with God all of the time. And if you're not, then you do not have a spiritual maturity. In this case of prophecy specifically, this is about hearing from God. There are legions of Christians who are disheartened and defeated, sometimes even questioning their own salvation because they feel that God is quiet, not speaking to them. The logic goes to them that in John 10, Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice. If you don't hear from Jesus, they think, oh, I must not be his sheep. He's not my shepherd. Oh dear, am I really saved? So for those who live in spiritual silence, this is torture for them. So in either desperation, yearning for what they consider to be uh, closeness with God or eagerness to hear from God, they can misinterpret what they believe to be from God. Also in the Old Testament, there are examples of prophets giving prophecies that were all positive, right? That, you know what? Hey, the king wants to hear this. And God's over here saying, don't listen to any of them for I have not spoken. Now I feel uh, close to this subject because there are basically two main reasons that I believe really drove me into the new age. One, I will probably make a video about at some point, but the second thing was I really, really craved and wanted supernatural experiences and got caught up in the new age. The interesting thing about this is when I really truly think about it, my motivation for wanting these experiences came down to a lack of faith. I saw the world around me, had doubts, and wondered where was God. So God, show yourself to me, became an addiction. It all falls down on one question for me that I'm going to give to those watching. Maybe you're upset at this video. Maybe you've gotten a lot out of this video. Uh, maybe you don't agree with me, but you're open to hearing. Uh, maybe you're really struggling with this. I don't know. But either way, it comes down to one question. Is Jesus alone enough for you? If you never had one supernatural experience at all, would you know how much God loved you based on his promises and his word, based on what Jesus did for you? Or do you measure how much he loves and approves of you based on experience with him? I want to say that those out there that are struggling with this, and if you've ever felt like some sort of secondhand Christian, God's love isn't founded on that at all. He loves you even if you do not feel Twitter pated all the time. So that was my night at a Sean Bowles prophecy seminar. Let me know your thoughts in the comments. 
I truly hope that this was a charitable but truthful assessment. As always, I'll have more resources that might interest you in the description, including that article that I mentioned before from Greg Kokel. Thanks for watching, guys.